Adam Smith argued that if each person pursues their own self-interest, the result will be optimal for the society as a whole. Why? Because I'm going to try to get as much value for myself as possible. You'll do the same. And we're going to do that in a free enterprise economy by producing as much value as we can for other people. The result of that will be the production of the greatest amount of value for the entire community. Well, that is something that does hold true under a wide range of conditions. But under certain conditions, it fails. We've seen one in the prisoner's dilemma, another potential for that in a stag hunt. And so we aren't always guaranteed that we're going to get an outcome that is really the best outcome we could get for the entire group. But under what circumstances will Smith's point hold? There have been a series of theorems proved in the history of economics by people like Pareto, Arrow, Debro, and others that try to refine this in various ways and make it more mathematically precise. I'm going to try to talk about some of this, what is known as the fundamental theorem of welfare economics, or the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics, in a kind of non-technical way. I hope I don't go too far astray. I'm a philosopher, not an economist, so I'm going to be trying to focus on the philosophical themes here. And I hope that I get the technical parts right, or at least put them aside enough that it doesn't matter for what I'm saying. But here's the general idea. A free enterprise economy, in a circumstance of information and pure competition, tends to produce an equilibrium that is optimal. Optimal in what sense exactly? Well, in the sense of Pareto, the idea is this. There is no way to improve the situation for any particular people without also making it less good for others. We could say that a situation is Pareto better than another if some people are better off in it and nobody's worse off. Something is Pareto optimal if there's nothing, nothing that is Pareto better than it. Which means, in other words, simply that we can't improve the lot of some people without also harming the lot of certain others. I can't improve your situation without making other people's situation worse. An equilibrium satisfies that when we're in a situation where, well, everybody's as well off as they can be if we try to improve somebody somebody else is going to be less well off. There's no way to improve everybody's welfare at the same time, or even make some people better off without harming anyone else. Arrow and Debro put it this way, the allocation of resources in a competitive equilibrium is optimal. It's well known that under suitable assumptions on the preferences of consumers and the production possibilities of producers, the allocation of resources in a competitive equilibrium is optimal in the sense of Pareto. No redistribution of goods or productive resources can improve the position of one individual without making at least one other individual worse off. Conversely, every Pareto optimal allocation of resources can be realized by a competitive equilibrium. So free enterprise systems tend toward these competitive equilibria that do tend to be optimal in Pareto's sense. They tend to lead us to situations that are efficient in the sense that we can't improve outcomes for anybody but without harming someone else. This theorem holds only under certain conditions. It will be important, first of all, that each person have some useful contribution to make. If some people simply can't make any useful contribution at all, then they have no role, really, in this competitive economy. They have no role in attaining any equilibrium, so what happens to them is completely unaffected by anything else going on. So it's unaffected by the theorem. So in short, if there are people who have no useful contribution to make, then this is really not going to apply to them. Secondly, each person has to have perfect information. Now, of course, even those who are highly skilled, highly knowledgeable, have a great deal of wisdom acquired in their given professions, do not have perfect information. They don't have perfect wisdom. And so this is something that real life economies approximate, aspire to, but never fully attain. Third, preferences have to be convex with diminishing marginal utility. 
it can't be the case there are some goods that the more you get, the more you want, and the better off it is. In, typically, we think of goods as things that have diminishing marginal utility. In other words, it's good up to a certain point, but then it gets less good. So, for example, you give me a burrito. I think that's delicious. I was really hungry. That burrito tastes great. You say, want another burrito? Well, maybe I'm pretty hungry. Okay, I'll take that second burrito. I'll start eating it. Is it as good giving me as much utility as that first burrito? Well, no. It's still good. Not as good as the first one was. Then you say, how about a third? Oh, no thanks. I, I've had enough. <laughs> okay, there's a pretty rapid diminution of marginal utility with respect to the burritos. But what about other kinds of goods? It may be important for me to have a car. So get me a car? Yes, that has a lot of utility. Get me a second car? Well, it's nice for different kinds of weather. Let's say it's great to have that convertible and, and hey, if one of them breaks down, I've got the other. That's nice. I get utility out of having a second car. How about a third car? Hmm, well, I don't know. Maybe it's not worth it at all to me. Or maybe it is, but much less than having the second one, which was less than having the first, and so on. Typically, goods are like that. And so we're going to assume that all goods are like that. Maybe there are some exceptions, but those tend to be dangerous kinds of goods. Highly addictive goods, for example. A little heroin makes you want more heroin, but that's an argument for outlawing heroin. And so let's assume that if there are goods that violate this, they are viewed as highly addictive and to be gotten rid of. They're not really very good at all. Finally, and this is an important one, we've got to assume there are no transaction costs. If every trade, if every exchange of goods and services comes with some transaction cost, ugh, then it's not going to be an efficient market because I won't be able to make small improvements in my welfare. The cost of the transaction itself will have to be taken into account. And so I will have to be able to improve my welfare quite a bit to overcome the cost of that. Consequently, that's something that will slow down the market. It will make it less efficient. It will make it harder to attain such a competitive equilibrium. And then it will be easy for there to be situations that are equilibria, but not Pareto optimal. We can improve maybe everybody's situation by lowering or removing transaction costs. Let's think about some of the exceptions we've already considered. What about a tragedy of the commons where each of us pursues our own good, but we don't attain the best outcome for everybody because there are some negative externalities to what each of us is doing. They're trivial in each individual case, but if everybody does them, if everybody grazes their sheep on the common pasture, then we're all worse off. Here the problem really is that we can't communicate and we can't reach agreements with the other farmers. Now there might be several reasons for that. Maybe it's a difficult thing to do. We can't easily communicate. Maybe there is no framework for us to be able to reach agreements. Maybe there's no way to enforce such agreements and so there's a lack of trust. Or maybe it's just difficult enough that there are significant transaction costs. Whether we think about overcoming the difficulties of communicating and agreeing, or we think about the risk we're accepting if the other farmers don't keep to their part of the agreement, there is a real transaction cost here. And so the tragedy of the commons, from one point of view, is due to a negative externality. But from another point of view, it's really a question of transaction costs. If we had perfect information, and if the transaction costs were zero, we could solve the problem in a couple of ways. We could reach an agreement and enforce that agreement to limit the amount of grazing on the common land. Or alternatively, we could simply buy parts of that common land. We could each buy a share of it and consequently it would all become private and there would no longer be a commons to have a tragedy of. So one solution is simply to allow the free market to operate, to sell off the common land, allow it to be owned, and then the problem will take care of itself. The other aspect though is to actually allow for enforceable agreements and to try to get rid of the transaction costs that make it difficult to attain and to rely upon and to enforce such agreements. The stag hunt is a different kind of situation. There, we could all hunt the stag, which would be the better outcome, the better equilibrium, or we could all hunt rabbits, 
which would be the less desirable equilibrium. In this situation, there is an equilibrium that actually no one of us can move to a better outcome, but nevertheless, all of us by cooperating could attain a better outcome. So we're in a situation where everybody could be better off. That is not a Pareto optimal equilibrium, even though it is a Nash equilibrium in the sense of game theory. Now, what's the problem there? Is there a problem of lack of information? Yes, in part, because I don't know whether the other people I have to cooperate with are actually still there helping me hunt the stag or whether they've gone off to hunt rabbits. But in part two, it is a transaction cost problem. There is the risk that other people will not comply with the agreement, that they will say, oh yes, I'll help you hunt the stag and then go off hunting rabbits. And so there is a risk of non-performance. And that is a kind of transaction cost. I've got to rely on the other people in that situation to cooperate with me and to continue cooperating with me. And if they don't, and if there's a risk that they won't, that's a potential cost. It's a cost I have to take into account in terms of computing the expected value. So there is something like a transaction cost here. So we can talk about stag hunts or tragedies of the commons in either way and think, yes, those are situations where we attain an equilibrium that is not optimal precisely because of imperfect information and transaction costs. If we take the theorem seriously, we realize, yes, those are two paradigm cases where things can go wrong, but there are others. What about those people who have no useful contribution to make? Those are problems from the point of view of this theory if there are people in our society, and surely in any real world society, there are people like this who cannot make any useful contribution to the economy. Children, for example, the severely disabled. There are people who are not going to be in a position to actually make a positive contribution. We'll have to make some provision for them separately. So. We mustn't think that, oh, well, <laughs> yes, you're comatose and in the hospital, but so much the worse for you. Uh, no, we're going to have to take such people into account. They're included, after all, in the community's welfare, even though they're not really included in the community of people engaged in the exchange of goods and services. So that will be an important exception in a real world economy. We're going to have to be concerned about deception, about lack of information, in all sorts of contexts, not just those that we've considered in stag hunts and tragedies of the commons. So lack of information can be a serious problem. We need for people to be informed, making decisions that are informed so that they know what they're doing and know what the choices are. We need to have a situation of competition. We need to have something like a level playing field. We need to have pure competition. If some people can monopolize, if competitors can band together and get rid of other competitors, as various social media companies recently did with a competitor, then we're not any longer in a situation of pure competition, and that can produce a suboptimal outcome. We're going to have to guard against monopolies, against cartels, against other people who are going to be working against free competition. And Smith was well aware of this. Adam Smith says at one point, I have never known a group of people in the same industry to get together without conspiring against the public. And so people do have a strong tendency to try to promote their own good by seeking to limit competition and move us away from a situation of pure competition. As soon as that happens, we can no longer guarantee that the economy is efficient and that we're going to be producing an optimal equilibrium. And finally, we've got to be concerned with transaction costs. We need to remove barriers to people making agreements with others, enforcing those agreements, making transactions, engaging in buying and selling. If we think about social institutions here, we realize, wait a minute, <laughs> we're a far distance from having zero transaction costs. For one thing, governments often impose sales taxes, employment taxes, transaction costs, no question about it. But in addition to that, think about what's required to make an agreement, enforce an agreement. You've got to hire attorneys. They've got to have filing fees. And just moving yourself 
or a small group of people from what is known as an S-Corp to a C-Corp, actually incorporating, appointing a board of directors and so on, and filing the requisite paperwork, all of that costs at least $10,000. And that's in a relatively unregulated, and that's in a relatively low regulation state like Texas. In other places, it can be much worse. So significant transaction costs are imposed on employment, on buying and selling, on all different kinds of transactions, and on agreements, often making agreements, enforcing agreements, costly endeavor. All of that pushes us away from a purely competitive economy, one that has equilibria that are truly optimal in the sense that we couldn't do any better for anybody without doing worse for someone else. That tells us something important then about the circumstances under which government intervention or some other kind of regulation might be justifiable. It would be to try to improve information, eliminate deception, care for those who have no useful contribution to make in the economic sense. It would be to lower transaction costs or get rid of them entirely. It would be to guarantee pure competition, to try to remove cartels, to try to break up trusts and monopolies. Those are legitimate roles of government in trying to attain optimal equality.